I think we are live now. In Sagar, can you confirm? I just got a notification. Sagar, should we start? I think uh, Sandesh, we are live. We have got a notification from live now. Oh, thanks. Good evening, Jai Bhim, Johar, and welcome everyone. My name is Sandesh Gangulde, and I'm a lawyer and working with the litigation team at Criminal Justice and Police Accountability Project. We have gathered today to mark Vimukta Divas, which is 71st anniversary of the repeal of the Draconian Criminal Tie Act, CTA. We are joined today by Justice Vishwanathan, who will be sharing his thoughts on the question of denotified tribes and criminal justice system. Before, I want to begin with a short introduction of CPA project. The CPA project is a research and litigation based intervention working on the question of targeting of oppressed caste community, particularly those known as denotified tribes or Vimukta communities in Madhya Pradesh. I will also provide a brief context of the significance of Vimukta Divas the origins which lie within the Criminal Tribe Act or CTA of 1871. The Criminal Tribe Act criminalized several nomadic, semi-nomadic and other tribal, including children from these communities and trans communities by naming them as a hereditary criminals addicted to the systematic commission of bailable offenses. The law provide extensive powers of surveillance, compulsory registration, taking fingerprints to the police with no rights afforded to those criminalized for questioning these provisions. The Criminal Tribes Act Inquiry Committee set up in 1949 recommended the repeal of the act as it was deemed inconsistent with the principles of equality and freedom that were campaigned as the foundation of independent India. Over last 71 years, number of members from denotified tribes have lost their lives to being deemed as habitual offenders. We want to remember a few of them today. Budhan Sabar, a member from West Bengal Sabar tribe who was murdered in the police custody. Chuni Kotal, the first woman graduated from Loda Sabar community who died by suicide as the result of caste's harassment at the workplace in 1992. And Indirmal Bai from Pardi community in MP who died as the result of police violence in 2017. Vimukta Divan and CPA project event today is an ode to a relentless resistance of denotified tribes as well as collectives and organizations of Vimukta communities such as Nomad Liberty Movement, Budhan Theater, Anubhuti Trust, Mazal and others. With this, I hand over to my colleague Harsh who will introduce our esteemed speaker for today. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thank you. Thank you, Sandesh. I am Harsh Kinger, and I work uh, as a part of the advocacy team at the Criminal Justice and Police Accountability Project. I would like to take this opportunity to introduce Honorable Justice Kalpati Venkatraman Vishwanathan. Justice Vishwanathan graduated from the Coimbatore Law College, Bhartiar University and enrolled as an advocate with the Bar Council of Tamil Nadu on 28th October 1988 and attended the chambers of late Shri K. A. Ramachandran, a leading criminal lawyer at Coimbatore between 1983 to 1988. He later joined the chambers of Mr. C. S. Vaidyanathan, a senior advocate and former additional solicitor general and assisted him in important cases before the Supreme Court, Delhi High Court, various other subordinate courts and tribunals between 1988 to 1990. He also chambered with Mr. K.K. Venugopal, senior advocate and former Attorney General for India from 1990 to 1995 and appeared with him in important cases. Justice Vishwanathan 
was designated as a senior advocate by the full court of the Supreme Court of India on 28th April 2009 and was appointed as the additional solicitor general of India on 26th August 2013 and held the position till May 2014. He appeared in varied range of cases on diverse subjects, including constitutional law, criminal law, commercial law, law of insolvency and arbitration, and including several appearances before the constitution benches of the Supreme Court. He also appeared before the Justice Verma Commission of Inquiry and the Justice M.C. Jain Commission of Inquiry. He has also contributed to the Chief Justice J.S. Verma Committee Report on Effectuation of Fundamental Duties under the topic of Administration of Justice. Justice Vishwanathan was recently elevated as the Judge of the Supreme Court of India directly from the bar on 19th May 2023. Thank you, sir, for agreeing to deliver this lecture on this important day. And without any further delay, I would like to hand it over to you, Justice Vishwanathan, and we are really excited to hear your thoughts, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Harsh, for that uh, generous introduction. At the outset, let me convey my uh, thanks to the Criminal Justice and the Police Accountability Project for inviting me uh, to share my thoughts on the eve of the 71st anniversary of the repeal of the CTA, even to spell out the name of the act sounds a very jarring note. It is the Criminal Tribes Act, which was repealed on 31st August throughout India on 1952. It is important that we have these uh, conversations because only then will we get to know. Some of you, of course, uh, work day in and day out uh, for the amelioration of the uh, denotified tribes uh, as they have now come to know. Uh, but some of you may be new to this uh, subject, would know the uh, grotesque and horrendous nature of uh, this legislation. We will, through the course of uh, uh, this conversation, uh, see how, how horrendous the act was when it uh, attributed criminality at the very birth with regard to certain uh, tribes. It mandated uh, registration, it provided for surveillance, it even enabled the executive to resettle them, apart from uh, subjecting them to compulsory uh, fingerprint without any uh, judicial oversight. And all this uh, was beyond uh, judicial review because the act, uh, which is a pre-constitutional act, said that not nothing of this could be called in question in any court of law. Now, Added to this, we need to also punctuate the talk with the instances of abuses uh, that the tribes were subjected to at the hands of the enforcing executive. Now, we will also, before we get to the core of this uh, uh, lecture, a conversation as I would like to call it, uh, about uh, the apprehension and the concerns expressed that the ugly shadow and the uh, evil tentacles of the CTA are in fact looming large even in the post-constitutional setup. These are concerns from quarters which are working on this sphere. So we need to address them. We cannot brush them aside. But before we get there, we need to understand as to what exactly this statute was, what did it provide for, how did the clarion call at the hands of some visionaries, some of whom we will name and celebrate here, call for the repeal of that, what led to the repeal. We will also do an analysis of the act on the anvil of the Indian constitution as it now stands and see you know, what would have been the fate of the law if it had been tested before the constitutional courts. 
we will see the social impact it had even after the denotification on the big communities. And then we will get to the post constitution, post repeal uh, scenario as to the concerns based on reports and empirical data which have surfaced and the fears expressed, the concern expressed based on statistics that the, the ghost of the CTA, as it were, is still haunting the current setup. We will then address the suggestions, if any, that within the legal legislative framework that we have, the major policy decision, legislative measures, we will have to await for parliament to uh, to you know speak on but within the legislative regime how do we address this are there any concrete suggestions that can be implemented we will look at some some of them so in the course of my uh, conversation with you you will pardon me if i refer to certain relevant uh, extracts certain relevant interventions in parliament made by made by unsung heroes who are not spoken of much, made by people who distributed pamphlets highlighting the grievances. We will read out short passages of the abuse that were subjected to, that the, that the communities were subjected to. So the conclusion is irresistible that the statute was not just an affront to the dignity of the members of the tribes in question, but uh, in my opinion, it was an affront to all right-thinking members who, who inhabit a, a civilized state. So in this background, uh, if we can first see as to why this, very, very briefly, why, why was this statute thought of? What was the uh, uh, historical reason behind it? And uh, uh, what do the studies say about it? And you will permit me to place uh, what the Bhikkhu Ramji Idate, Sri Bhikkhu Ramji Idate Commission had to say on this. Others have written about it. But uh, I found this passage uh, most telling as to how a wrong historical notion that circulated in some. Uh, European uh, countries, Scotland and England, that crime is hereditary in nature. Now, this theory, which has been disputed by historians like uh, uh, Sri Majumda, who deposed before the Ayanga committee, which recommended repeal, uh, is a false theory. The theory has no basis, but it was this theory that crimes are hereditary which led to the conception of the statute and the prevalent caste system in India only aided. So when both came together, it was a fertile ground to enact a legislation for the province of India. And let us now briefly see what uh, Sri Bhikkhu Ramji Idate had to say on the reason why the statute was introduced. Of course, unless we know this, we, we will not be able to logically move forward and address the core issue of the shadow looming large. Sri Dathya says that the category of criminal tribes were born out of the colonial British government's misguided attempt to control crime in India by enactment of the Criminal Tribes Act 1871. Through this, as well as subsequent versions of the Act, the British branded nearly 150 communities as being criminal by birth. These communities were placed in settlements and were policed regularly. They were placed under constant surveillance and their movement regulated. This led to harassment, loss of livelihood, and the denial of even the basic rights enshrined by law. The creation of the category of criminals was a product of colonial modernity and the strengthening of the various apparatuses of the nation state. By 1860, the emergence of the new working class in the post industrial revolution. Uh, uh, Britain, the state was at odds in trying to control its citizens. It was out of this necessity that the government began to differentiate between the industrious working classes and the criminal working classes. This gave birth to the Act 1869, 
and it was amended in 1911-1924, which was the ultimate act which came to be repealed in 1952. So this created enormous stress on the communities. They were pushed into the hinterland, into the uh, forest, and their nature of livelihood and the nature of you know, sustenance changed. Uh, they were subjected to uh, innumerable hardships. So idea was, you know, brand people based on their community, their tribe as criminals, enact a, a statute and provide for various measures, which we will come to a little later. Contextually, on the uh, history uh, part, we also need to uh, remember that apart from the colonial government's obsession to ordering the Indian society and the, and the, uh, and the uh, uh, racist you know, approach, which was then uh, uh, prevalent, branding person to be born a criminal and you know, treating, them, uh, treating it as a hereditary phenomenon was, as I said, born out of certain wrong historical notions which were prevalent in Scotland. Dr. Mazumdar, a respected Indian historian, debunked the theory it is crime is not a hereditary, it is a product of bad environment and poor economic conditions. But by then it was too late, the act was enacted. And, and what did this act provide for? It presumed criminality, not just on an individual. It presumed criminality on the entire tribe or community. Under section three, any tribe, gang, or class of persons, or any part of a tribe or class was addicted to the systematic commissioning, all on subjective satisfaction. A recommendation would go by the local executive head that this tribe has to be notified, and thereafter notification would follow the procedure for registration, procedure for uh, fingerprinting, procedure for surveillance, power to resettle them, all that would inure to the benefit of the executive. Through a single notification under the CTA, communities were tarnished and painted criminal. Presumption of criminality was formulated against any member belonging to such a tribe uh, and the burden uh, uh, which they had were doomed to carry for no fault of theirs. So as was rightly pointed out at the introduction by Sandesh, children were also not spared just for the fault of being born, the biological accident of being born in a certain place to a certain set of parents who belong to a particular community. The notification under 29 could not be challenged, 79 of the Erstwhile uh, Act, the tribes were required to get themselves registered with the local governments, fingerprints forcibly collected, no judicial oversight on the fingerprints being taken, and, and they were restricted to a specific area, et cetera, et cetera, which I told you this, this is, uh, according to me, a serious affront uh, to the dignity of not only the uh, tribes in question, and I repeat, to the dignity of every well-meaning, right-thinking individual who, who, who inhabits a civilized territory. But the act was in vogue. It was in vogue for a large number of years, subjecting the communities to tremendous hardships. We will illustrate a few of them when we come there. Now, suppose we were to juxtapose this act uh, alongside our constitution. It would fail on several grounds. The constitution was adopted in 1949 and the, uh, the repeal had been uh, recommended in 52. The repeal was also done. There's no occasion for the uh, court to strike it down. But straight away, a constitutional uh, uh, student would tell you that the act was a serious affront to the concept of uh, dignity impinging directly Article 21. Apart from being overbroad in its classification, it put everyone, whether he was involved in a crime or not in a crime, merely because of the accident of birth, is manifestly arbitrary. It is uh, violative of Article uh, 14. Now, 
the fingerprinting, if today you were to test it, uh, what uh, uh, Puttaswamy, uh, both the Puttaswamy judgments have said, you see, with, with no judicial oversight and no control is a serious invasion of the right to privacy also. So the act was clearly unconstitutional. We are commemorating its uh, repeal. Normally, you commemorate the advent of, you know, something like the constitution or people who believe in Magna Carta, you know, commemorate the advent. But this is a statute where you need to commemorate and remember the repeal because it was such a, a, a grotesque a, a statute. Uh, one could uh, not imagine that such statutes existed. Uh, fortunately, the constitution came and there was, it became completely untenable. Now, what was the social impact uh, this statute had on the psyche of the first on the psyche of the individual concerned secondly on the society itself the ayanga committee the ananda sayana ayanga committee the speaker records that quite apart from other reasons for which the law and constitutional city also left a permanent scar on the societal structure of our country and has since deeply affected the way in which members of the DNT, denotified tribes as they are now called, are viewed by the other members of the society. Now, this is recorded, the following which I am going to read. In the Ayanga committee, the members of the tribes who were working in several establishments were turned out by their management upon finding that they belong to tribes which were branded criminal under the city. Now, this is the impact it had. Now, we are talking of you know, the uh, 50s and the 60s, constitution had just come into force. We were a nascent uh, republic. The shadow of the repealed act was still looming large. The, the ugly tentacles were still, you know, uh, uh, spreading, its, uh, uh, spreading its might. The society as a whole viewed them with suspicion and treated them with humiliation. Innocent members of the whole communities were not allowed to integrate with other members of the society, and several generations were made to carry this tag as a birthmark. Now, this was the societal impact. Now, here it is time now for us to recollect some of those unsung heroes who clamored for the repeal of the act, who, with their vast experience, the foot soldiers that they were, highlighted the practical impact the act was having on the field. People who had valid interventions in parliament when the repeal act was debated, people who deposed before the Iyengar commission, people who distributed uh, pamphlets, who wrote about this to create awareness, visionaries who thought far, far ahead of their times. Um, now, firstly, Sri Raghavaya, a member of the Legislative Assembly from the Madras province, circulated a pamphlet. I, I did make an effort to get that pamphlet. I spoke to the uh, libraries, but I'm told it was uh, very reasonably priced, but somehow it's uh, out of print. The, uh, your organization should uh, make an effort to uh, retrieve it and uh, uh, you know republish it with uh, uh, you know, adequate uh, permissions if necessary. Now, it appears because under the Act, the tribes had to report to the police station and it also gave power to do surveillance. The executive machinery would, in the middle of the night, would go for uh, surveillance, two roll calls. And if they are not found, that itself was treated as a, a violation of the Act. Now, this put a tremendous stress on the uh, individuals. So what did they do? They decided that the best way to be not subjected to a false roll call and a false reporting was to just go to the police station or the police party's house and sleep there in groups. So that you can't say that I was not available when you came for surveillance. This is unimaginable. Now, look at what Sri Raghavaya had to say in the pamphlet. 
the illiterate registered member who has no knowledge of the correct time and who wishes to avoid the inconvenience of keeping awake the whole night, as well as the risk involved in passing through the village and being apprehended at the dead of night on some suspicion or the other, prefer to sleep at the police station itself or at the residence of the village party, often on the roadside and in the dust, exposing himself to the rigors of the weather. Apart from the great inconvenience felt in this manner of reporting, what defense evidence could there be at dead end of night for one whose presence is maliciously not noted in the register by the village officer or the enforcing authority to prove that he was actually present? Now, this is equally graphically brought out by Dr. Patabi, who spoke during his intervention in parliament, and that is really telling. This is part of Dr. Patabi's speech as taken from the extracts of the parliamentary debates leading to the repeal of the CTA. Once I was lodged in the police station, I saw there early in the morning about 40 or 50 corpse-like bodies lying flat on the bare ground without even a mat. And when I inquired what the matter was, they said that they were members of the criminal tribes who under the law had to sleep in the compound of the police station. The very pigs and dogs are not treated like that. This is what Dr. Patabi says in parliament to make the point. And if they do not, they are sentenced to one year, two years and so on. It is a common habit of the policemen on beat at night to visit these areas and call out the names of people who must answer and give attendance twice in the night. Once at 11 o'clock and another time at half past one or two. Now look at what he says. We all know in what dread we go to bed if we have to wake up at midnight in order to go to the aerodrome or to the railway station. But day in and day out, and night in and night out, these people have to sleep under the fear of being called and giving attendance. Granted that they give attendance, that does not matter. If the policeman wants his goat, pig or fowl and does not get it, he will mark him absent. There is no appeal and he is immediately hauled up and given six months imprisonment. The man cannot go to his brother's place or his cousin's place or his father-in-law's place or see his wife who might have gone for confinement to her mother and leave will not be granted under any circumstance whatsoever. Now, if this is bone chilling, the passage which I am now going to read out to you, part of Dr. Patabi's speech is actually blood curdling. That this could have happened pre-independence, personally witnessed by eminent people is simply unbelievable. Dr. Patabi says, apart from this, a very peculiar custom prevails in the jails. There, the working of scavenging is not allotted to all prisoners, irrespective of their caste. It is only assigned to Harijans and to members of the criminal tribe. Now, it doesn't stop there. Whenever they feel a paucity of scavengers in jail, all that the superintendent of jail has to do is to inform the superintendent of the police and immediately a batch of these people are convicted and sent to bail so that they could do the business. Dr. Patabi continues, they have got so much accustomed to free service from these people that somehow or the other, they get these people to do their work at home, always free. So this is how the in, in practice it operated when the act was invoked. Now, this background is important when we get to the core of the topic, but without this, you will not be able to realize the seriousness of the concern. Now, the holding as I do the office, be failing in my duty if I don't highlight the concern, which is backed by data, and see what can be uh, redressed. Any policy issue, it's for the appropriate bodies to step in. But this is something which we must be posted off because these are well-documented, well-recorded part of parliamentary records before the act was repealed. These are only two, this is my comment, among the countless instances of such bone chilling and blood curdling abuse of human rights and dignity of the people belonging to the oppressed communities, particularly the persons belonging to the DNTs. 
the law and its machinery, which is to protect and uplift the downtrodden, was being used to further oppress the free citizens. Now, this led to the constitution of the Dr. Iyengar Committee, that constituted by then, and uh, the act was recommended for its uh, repeal. Now, no doubt, the act was repealed, but as it was repealed, Sri Velayudam had an important intervention in parliament, and I will read that, and then we will go to the core topic as to how is it playing out today post-independence. Sri Velayudam says that you do not know, he's telling parliament, I have studied the thing. The act will certainly affect the life of the criminal tribes. That is what is going to happen. Let not the house go away with the impression that 4 million people have been liberated by the repeal of the act. The act may come in another form later on. Now, this is the concern which now in well-informed quarters that, uh, you know, is being highlighted. And it is better that we, as uh, the legal community, uh, the sociologists, are posted of this so that, you know, it can be addressed. And at the end of the talk, I propose to uh, share with you some suggestions which can be within the legal framework, uh, you know, thought of to be implemented. Now, that act went away. Now, today we have the Habitual Offenders Act enacted in different states, being a state subject. I'm told about nine odd states have that. There is the wrong notion uh, prevalent that there is a central act. There's no central act. But there are provisions scattered. There's provisions in the CRPC in section 110. Now, 110, the executive magistrate is empowered to order security to be furnished by a habitual offender who is residing within its jurisdiction. Now, the habitual offender is not defined, but uh, you borrow the definition from the state statutes. There are still statutory manuals which deem the original tribes as habitual offenders because they were once notified and subsequently denotified. We'll deal with one such clause in the Madhya Pradesh uh, uh, jail manual, which has been highlighted in uh, studies. Now, 110 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, the executive magistrate is empowered to order security to be furnished by a habitual offender who's residing within his jurisdiction. However, the code itself does not define the habitual offender. Instead, the definition is drawn from the respective state statutes or depends on the discretion of the enforcing machinery of the police and jail authorities excise through executive instructions. Regulation 411.4 of the Madhya Pradesh Jail Manual, 1987, which explicitly provided that habitual criminals would include within its ambit any member of denotified tribe subject to the discretion of the state government concerned. Further, in many cases, the orders under section 110 are considered to be convictions. So this is part of a CPJ a study conducted and it's a concern. If it is a statutory instrument, it has to be immediately addressed. We will later see how a similar uh, statutory provision in Rajasthan uh, uh, was, you know, uh, eviscerated from the statute after the High Court intervened in a, in a Suomoto jurisdiction. We will quickly uh, see that as we uh, go along. The lack of clarity in defining habitual offender has been shown by studies that members of the denotified tribes who were formerly categorized as criminal tribes, then identified and subjected to movement restrictions and also directed to provide security for good behavior. Now, this is a concern expressed based on certain empirical study. So it's time that it is taken note of. In an informative article written by members who work for uh, CPJA uh, titled Settled Habits, New Tricks, Castiste Policing uh, Meets Big Tech in India. And I want to name the authors because I found this passage uh, important. Amaya Bokil, Avanindra Kare, Nikita Sonawane, Surjana Bej, and 
Vaishali Janardana have the following to say. Police stations across India maintain registers of habitual offenders, also called history sheeters in their jurisdictions with extensive details of their lives and daily movements. While their identification may not explicitly be based on caste, collective police action overwhelmingly identifies members of DNT communities as habitual offenders. Now, if it were only a statement or an ipse dixie, one could have ignored it. But this is based on a record which they have seen in a particular police station which they name in the state of Madhya Pradesh in the capital. They go on to say, so pervasive is the fear of having one's daily life recorded in police registers that Rana, much like other Pardis, identified as a habitual offender, rethinks every activity of his life, including something as mundane as going to the local tea stall with friends. These records shackle the Pardi community's lives, freedoms and dignities. Arguably the most important section of the habitual offenders register is an informal record, not authorized by statute, an informal record that is maintained and which the officer must sign to attest that they have personally trailed or surveilled the habitual offender at least once every fortnight to investigate whether he or she had, despite extensive surveillance, managed to outwit the police to commit the theft. And they refer to the Bhopal's Govindpura police station of having shown them this register. And if this is true, this needs to be investigated because even the Apex Court, the, the Honorable Chief Justice recently had to had referred to the passage from the Ankush Maruti Shinde judgment in a, in a, in a speech which uh, was very telling. In a passage of uh, the judgment, which is very telling, I will uh, read it out for you. Ankush Maruti Shinde, State of Maharashtra, 2019-15 Supreme Court cases, 470. The court allowed the review petitions of the accused belonging to nomadic tribes while noting that roping in of persons from such tribes was a common occurrence in investigations. These are words of the Supreme Court. Chief Justice Shah speaking for it. The Chief Justice reiterated it in a recent speech. And the review petitions were, uh, were allowed, and the accused persons, uh, you know, uh, who were not involved were uh, set free. Now, this is the, the core area of which is of concern now. And the earlier portion was the background as to how it is now the ghost of the CTA, as it were, is, is still haunting. And this is a fear expressed by people seriously involved in a study and it is time that it is addressed. Now, the two reports, uh, uh, two reports which have uh, been released by the Criminal Justice and the Police Accountability uh, Project, the CJPA, uh, uh, does repay a study. The one uh, dealing with the MP Excise Act and the Wildlife Protection Act, because these have you know, bearing on the occupation, the traditional occupation which uh, the members of these communities were resorting to. And there is a concern that the existing uh, uh, legislation uh, is, is, is out of tune and doesn't provide for, uh, provide for considering certain customary uh, occupations uh, which the, uh, the members of the communities have from time immemorial, having been pushed into the forest as we saw earlier, that has become the means of livelihood. And that is being, you know, mistaken for a grave offense under the existing statutes. And they suggest a certain tailoring uh, of those statutes. This portion alone, you will permit me to uh, read because it is not just the uh, committee uh, for uh, police accountability, uh, criminal justice and police accountability, which says that the denotified tribe commission, the second one, which was uh, headed by Sri Balakrishna Sidram Renkir, also echoes similar sentiments. Now, these are documents which are available 
and which cannot be uh, you know brushed aside uh, all that is being highlighted is that uh, if there is a concern expressed it has to be uh, addressed in the way that is possible the livelihoods of many members this is my comment the dnt dep dnt depends on several occupations which are termed as traditional occupations however due to the impact of industrialization and urbanization several of these traditional occupations have uh, gone out of vogue the renke commission the denotified tribes commission the first one we saw um, was uh, the idatte commission the, the renke commission also has something to comment on this uh, the changes are mostly due to colonial, globalization, modernization, uh, uh, urbanization, technological advancement, changes in agricultural practices, market intervention, and commercialization. This part is from the Renke Commission, which I read. Now, further, the Balakrishna Siddharam Renke Commission, Sri Balakrishna Siddharam Renke Commission says the change in laws, particularly the Forest Act, the Wildlife Protection Act, and the Excise Act, according to Sri Renke, has affected the denotified nomadic and semi nomadic communities by denying them access to the resources to which they have traditional rights and deprived them of their livelihoods. In fact, it made them criminals overnight without offering them any sustainable alternatives. The study by the CJPA also gives statistics based on the RS of an analysis as to what percentage are from these uh, erstwhile, you know, denotified tribes uh, in Madhya Pradesh under the Excise Act. And they say 7% of the RS of the 56.35, which is overall of the oppressed communities, are from uh, uh, members of the denotified tribes, a percentage uh, which they feel, uh, based on their experience and studies, so large uh, that it can't uh, be actual violation is the conclusion. In the context of the Wildlife Protection Act, there is a concern expressed that a lot of complaints are registered based on unidentified informants known as mukbis and uh, it appears 86 percent was based on uh, uh, identified unidentified uh, informants um, to the effect that there have been uh, violations in the wildlife act uh, so the, the, the suggestion is that this has to factor in like several statutes factor in uh, custom etc the traditional occupations uh, should be put beyond the purview, but these are policy matters on which uh, uh, it would be difficult to comment concretely, but the policy makers will definitely be keeping an eye on this, and there's no reason to doubt that it will be uh, addressed uh, and the grievances uh, would be redressed. So the, the, the constitutional principle that is sought to be urged by these studies both by the commission and by the project is that certain statutes post constitution which may appear facially neutral facially neutral as up, up, up applying to all across the board are in the manner of its operation being targeted to the erstwhile denotified tribes and that they perhaps feel based on data that they are seen as low hanging fruits easy targets easy pickings uh, for persecution. Now, I mentioned the Rajasthan High Court SOMOTO intervention, and I want to repeat it because I thought it was a valid uh, SOMOTO intervention. The Rajasthan High Court in 2020 took SOMOTO cognizance of the Rajasthan prison manual, which allowed the jail authorities to identify cars and then allowed jobs such as cleaning toilets and sweeping only to persons belonging to the lower strata. Be, uh, of the society based on their caste. But one must mention and uh, where a good act is done, the Rajasthan government did amend the prison rules as a sequel to the Suomoto cognizance 
and did away with caste-based classification better late than never, but it did happen. Now, having said all this, uh, I know you've already sp uh, spent a lot of large part of your evening. Uh, the conversation would be incomplete unless you know some suggestions uh, are left for you to mull over. You could give it an appropriate shape uh, because your people who work on this uh, to ameliorate the condition to ensure that there are no you know recurrences like it was warned in Ankush Maruti Shinde. Uh, the, I have a few suggestions to offer. Some of them have uh, been mentioned in the uh, denotified commissions. Some may have been mentioned elsewhere, but this occurred to me, and I think uh, these are important to be aired. Uh, one is, of course, sensitizing the enforcement machinery. Uh, these the heads of the states, the chief secretaries could have uh, an inclusive committee which will uh, sensitize the law enforcing agencies to the literature that is already available, the background, things what we have discussed, so that wittingly or unwittingly, you know, the tentacles of the CTA are not allowed to permeate the present administration of the criminal justice. So, sensitizing the law enforcement agencies is a primordial necessity. Being a former member of the National Legal Services Authority, uh, I would also want the District Legal Services Authority uh, to play a more active role because the earliest point that the abuse can be checked is at the uh, police stations. So if at the pre-litigation stage itself, uh, the DLSA it could be activated to have a role, uh, like I was a Michael Curie as a lawyer in um, a child missing um, case. And I found that thanks to the Supreme Court judgment in Bachman Bachao Andol, the Union of India took a very uh, welcome, proactive role uh, thanks to, of course, the intervention of the court and issued a standard operating procedure. And in the standard operating procedure, I found that uh, a member of the uh, District Legal Service Authority uh, was attached to a, a police station. And whenever, you know, there was a missing report or a retrieved child, since certain protocol had to be followed, uh, the DLSA representative was uh, there to counsel, etc. I'm drawing an analogy here that if you know at the pre-litigation uh, stage uh, the legal aid could be ensured, and I would think uh, uh, it is a constitutional obligation uh, for the executive to not just uh, follow the procedure and the documentation that the CRPC prescribes, but also positively, you know, uh, inform the accused of their uh, rights. Uh, I remember a case uh, under the narcotics uh, when the issue of uh, the right to be searched before a gazetted officer was involved. The constitution bench of the Supreme Court, uh, I think was, was in Vijay Janduba, Jadeja's case, I think. It said that uh, not just uh, a right, it is, there's a right to be informed that you have such a right in you. So I think that will make a lot of difference. Uh, it is a right to be informed uh, of the protections available, uh, making available uh, legal advice so that, you know, they could immediately nip certain violations in the bud. Uh, the, I've already suggested if a standard operating procedure could be formulated because uh, there's no dispute on this fact that the CTA uh, was draconian not just draconian, it was uh, 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 a, a horrendous and a grotesque uh, statute. And that if several people have been liberated, uh, that liberation should not just be in letter, it should operate in its true spirit. I would also want a greater proactive role for the State Human Rights Commission, that's suggestion number four. Already, the uh, 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 
uh, Sri Lanka Commission has uh, spoken about this. I would welcome that uh, suggestion. Uh, he suggested an the commission to be an inclusive body, a diverse body, and uh, I think it is a welcome suggestion. Um, cases of false implication should be seriously dealt with. The review of laws, of course, is for the policy makers to decide punishments. Uh, that is for them to take note of. But since concerns have been addressed by commissions appoint, I think I'm sure uh, it will be getting a serious look. Prejudicial laws that mirror the CTA, if existent, like the one we saw in Madhya Pradesh, the Rajasthan uh, uh, provision, uh, it should be reviewed. Uh, it will not be uh, too much to say that uh, the DLSA and the state human rights uh, should even be allowed to audit the HO register till such time a final solution is found uh, as to how, how we find a mechanism for it because there has to be, uh, you know, a, a check as to a maintenance of, uh, you know, registers not guaranteed by the statute. There's no, no two opinions that that can't exist. So there's no other way that you can check it now. Of course, uh, we have uh, the press, which have been uh, fairly sensitive, uh, but as is always, you know, uh, it is better that uh, any offenses reported in the reporting of it, uh, a certain uh, uh, great sensitivity is shown so that, you know, the uh, prejudice is not uh, revived and they have been playing a stellar role. I will continue to play that role and equally for the uh, civil society so that they are also sensitized of it. And I think that is where uh, conversations like this uh, would prove to be an eye opener, like it was an eye opener for me on various aspects, as we saw those uh, illustrated violations, abuses, uh, it will be an eye opener. And I think it has to be addressed on a, a comprehensive scale uh, from all the uh, well-meaning citizenry, from the uh, all the institutions. And I congratulate uh, uh, the Criminal Justice and Project Accountability Project for uh, launching uh, these, you know, conversations. And I thank you sincerely for the opportunity. And I would also want to express my gratitude to uh, Mr. Arvind Raj, uh, my law clerk, uh, for, uh, you know, working on this thoroughly and periodically sitting with me and uh, uh, discussing the aspects uh, as to how uh, to the best of uh, you know uh, our uh, uh, resources and time we could uh, you know present uh, the scenario thank you very much uh, good evening to you once again thank you so much sir my name is sakri samu and i've been working as the communications intern with cpa project since last year on behalf of my team i want to express our sincere gratitude to justice kb vishwanathan for de delivering CPA project's annual Vimukta Divas address. Sir, we truly appreciate your willingness to be a part of this occasion and share your eye-opening insights on how the legacy of the CPA continues to influence our post-independence criminal justice system. Your presence and your wisdom have greatly enriched our understanding of the challenges and reforms within the Indian criminal justice system. We'd like to thank Rashid sir and the Live Law team for collaborating with us. You can find the video recording of today's lecture on their YouTube channel. We are grateful for everyone who has joined us today and contributed to making this event a success. Let this Mumukta Divas serve as a reminder that we must continue to work tirelessly to dismantle discriminatory laws and practices that infringe upon the rights of an individual or community. Once again, thank you all for being a part of this event and we look forward to your continued support in our mission to promote justice, equality, and freedom for all. We wish you a significant and revolutionary Vimukta Divas. Jai Bhim, Jai Savitri, Kuljo. Thank you.